Welcome back. I hope you had a great lunch and that you're ready to learn some more as we continue to delve in this, into this discussion on student success. Thank you for joining us today for Lehman Student Success Summit, LS3. For those of you who didn't join for the first half of the day, my name is Victor Brown and I am the Associate Provost for Academic Programs and Educational Effectiveness. My colleague, Elena Jadko, the Director of Online Education is my co-host for today. The Student Success Summit is being conducted in high flex form, allowing virtual and in-person participation. Both audiences will partake in all parts of today's conference in a similar fashion. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping notes we would like to share. We have taken the liberty to mute all Zoom participants' microphone and ask that they remain muted until you should like to, speak, to ask a question during the question and answer segment. For those of you joining us in person, if you haven't already done so, please join us in Zoom via your registration commit confirmation link. The guest Wi-Fi is student underscore success and the password is summit 2021. Please keep your microphone muted. To ensure an organized question and answer session, if you would like to ask a question at the end of the panel presentation, please use the hand raising feature. Or if you prefer that we ask a question for you, please use the chat feature and message Elena directly. In person guests, please come to the microphone and wait to be called on. In person guests, uh, sorry, as a reminder, Please unmute your microphone when your name is called and to ask your question. If possible, please turn on the video component and please state your name and affiliated organization. Thank you for joining us for the third session this morning. And this session is entitled Conceptualizing General Education Through Atlas. And this will be facilitated by Dr. Karen Beck, the Associate Dean for the School of Arts and Humanities. Dr. Beck. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Karen Beck. I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities. And I'm also part of this team that um, has been working on this Atlas program for the last year. I think we started last summer um, working on this. So this, this is going to be Max Hyflex. I'm the only one of the panel who's actually in the room. The other three members of the panel are doing this on Zoom. So please bear with us if we have any technical difficulties handing over the from the room to the Zoom and back and forth, but I think we will be doing fine. So I'm, you know, our panel members today are, um, are me as the facilitator, and that's also my role in the project. I'm the facilitator of the project as an administrator. The two PIs of the project are Mila Burns and La Rose Paris. Mila Burns, Professor Mila Burns from Latin American Studies, La Rose Paris from Africana Studies. Also on the panel today is one of the um, faculty members who have who are participating in our pilot project this year, and also somebody who is <clears throat> somebody who is very important for our project, and you know we call her a friend of the project, um, and she has been bringing it forward a lot. Um, Alicia Galvez, professor of excellence and professor in Latin American studies. So I'm going to give a hopefully really short introduction, and then I will hand it over to Professor Burns on the Zoom. So, hmm, hmm. maybe not. Oh, so what's, what does ATLAS actually stand for? It stands for Anchored in the Liberal Arts. It is a project that is really about emphasizing the liberal arts education for transfer students, and especially for students who are aiming for the professional majors such as business or health. 
So we are we are aiming for a really transformative education at Lehman. What does this mean? So the advantage of being a speaker in the afternoon is that you have listened to the people in the morning. So I can quote what transformative has meant this morning. So we're giving a transformative education. Has this morning we were said it was said it was very important that students graduate. And I quote. Transformative, transforming life means increasing the quality of life, increased civic engagement, and postgraduate professional success. This is all very important and central for transforming lives through education. However, at the center of a liberal arts education is the opening of the mind, the transformation of thinking, the opening of possibilities. So the goal of the, of the classes in the Atlas program using trans what we call transformative texts is to make students feel that they are part of a global conversation dealing with big questions. And through this, that they are part of this college and that they belong here. They are part of the community of Lehman College. They are part of a community of scholars. And that community goes both global and traditional in, in a chronological way as well. They are experiencing a common intellectual experience in their courses They tackle with difficult texts. And um, together, and this togetherness brings them the feeling of being part of this community and helps them. And this is that what we see as the transformative experience. We are doing this so far with a planning grant from the Tegel Foundation um, in cooperation with the LEH liaisons and the LEH coordinator. We have um, and the faculty that have agreed to teach pilot classes in the fall. Um, and we are very lucky to have both full-time faculty and adjunct faculty who have agreed to sit down over the summer, rewrite their syllabi and teach a different kind of course in the fall. We are also working closely with department chairs, mainly in the humanities, but also in the social sciences and in the health sciences. In spring 2021, we had a workshop series called Teaching with Transformative Texts, where we had outside speakers. All of these workshops are available online, un well, not unfortunately, but for copyright reasons, only for the Lehman community. So you have to be able to access the uh, Lehman uh, with the, um, to get to these workshops. Um, but if you want to see some Dr. Gardner, some of them I can make available outside as well. Um, in fall 21, we are running the nine pilot classes and we are working on assessing those pilot classes immediately. We're planning for the spring. We're planning the faculty development. The concept will be to have these courses that are teached in, based on transformative texts. Faculty are changing their syllabi from a more textbook or scholarly text syllabus to a transformative text syllabus. And then they're working together as a cohort on talking about the pedagogy and the implication of this. And I'm grateful for Professor Galvez who came up with the model to say that we will model this on the WAC model. So just like the writing across the curriculum, develop cohorts always work together, discuss each other's syllabi and learn how to teach this, we want to use the same kind of model for the transformative text courses going forward. We're currently developing classes and we're also reaching out to other departments and working with departments. Professor White is up there. We just talked about this um, to, to develop courses that are helping the students to bridge that gap that they often feel between general education and their major with the goal of probably developing a minor out of this. What is a transformative text? A transformative text is to put it very shortly, a text that makes you question everything you thought you know. And then you go from there. 
Here is the definition we have right now. It's very long. I can email it to everybody. You don't have to read it in its full length right now. This is also very preliminary because we noticed that we made it very, very scholarly because this is where we come from. That is usually the first step we make and we will work on it a little further. Um, So what is the primary, and you know, we, are, we want to shift it more towards the use of primary texts instead of the scholarly texts like novels, essay, poems, plays, speeches. And when I say texts, I mean works. It, you know, text in the broadest sense. Works of art will definitely be considered texts in this context. And that is definitely something we still have to work on um, in our own thinking, not always to start with the written word. So we have this idea of novels, essay, poems, plays, speeches, enduring works. These can be works of philosophy, works of literature, works of scholarship that have become seminal can also be part of that. But another way of thinking about it is to use, to focus on voices from outside the academe and voices that are often marginalized, that students are talking about these voices because the important thing is we want to develop a corpus of texts that reflects our Lehman value. Dr. Gardner spoke this morning about how are we communicating the Lehman values to the students. And one way to do this is to develop this corpus of texts that reflects our Lehman values, reflects the diversity of our students and goes even beyond that. Currently, we do have a list of approximately 150 texts already. That is sort of our brainstorming list. We're working on making this smaller, but we are also ready to make, make the next steps of opening that discussion to way more faculty members and get input from more people to first expand that list and then have a huge discussion about what are the texts we should focus on. And this is the end of my presentation and I am ready to hand this over to Mila. Okay, I was trying very hard to unmute myself. It seems harder <laughs> than I felt like. Thank you so much, Karin, and thank you all for joining us today. It's such a joy to be able to be here talking with our community about this project that we all love so much and have worked so hard on. So before I start my very, very brief presentation, I would like to ask uh, all of you who are here with us online, if possible, to share uh, here through the chat uh, box, uh, a text, a book that changed your life, transformed you somehow. I can think of many, uh, just one is gonna be more than enough. And as Karin said, this is a collaborative effort. So everything that you put on the chat is something that we're gonna take to our list and try to uh, discuss and present to other faculty so that we can really enhance uh, this idea. So thank you so much if you can do that. I myself can think of many different books. The thing is that we started feeling that only putting them together would not be enough, especially because our mind and history can trick us. So I'll tell you briefly about one personal experience that I had roughly two years ago when I decided to change my entire syllabus of a class I love to teach here at Lehman called Women in Latin America. I decided that I would only use authors who were women, preferably women of color. I knew many people would say, but you have to go to, you know, with the best authors, not with certain authors because they look a certain way. But I thought to myself, how will I ever know who are the best authors if I simply don't get to read them? So I decided to do that. And instead of maybe three weeks to put a good list together, when what we usually would take me to put a good syllabus together, it took me roughly three months, maybe four. Why, right? People who wrote about women in Latin America were not necessarily women in Latin America. There was spending all my precious days of summer looking for these people as if they were a kind of secret society. So why, right? And there are many obvious explanations for a very long time in many places, women were preventing, prevented from writing. So obviously for a long time in many places they wrote less. The same happened to all kinds of uh, groups, so-called minorities that we can think of. 
people of color in many places and for a very long time. And it came to a point when we have a very sad reality. And I asked to share my screen. Uh, is, it, is it possible for the host to uh, let me do that? I thought I was already allowed, but apparently I cannot. Um, if you could give it a try, Mila, one more time. I am. I am you should here. Have made a yeah. co-host. I'll double check. Okay. Um, I don't see myself as a co-host in the least either. Uh, so yeah, I can't. Karin, do you you have it there, right? Would it be too hard for you to let me share? No, right? Okay. Let's see. One second. One second, everyone. Sorry for that. See, those things are harder. <laughs> Harder than we expect. So, Mila, can you, yes. Oh, sorry, can you try that one more time? I think now it's working. Thank you so much. So it came to a point, as you can see, this is uh, data from the United Nations, when even today, over 60% of the world elite rates are women. So we still are, are feeling the results of that. And uh, of course, that reading and writing are privileges, as we said, as we've seen historically, and somehow privilege begets privilege, right? So when you look at the list of uh, the top 10 most cited authors across all fields, that's what you have. And don't get me wrong, I love these guys. I use many of them uh, in my teaching, in my classes, Michel Foucault, Pierre Bourdieu, all his writings on gender, I use in my classes, including women in Latin America, uh, but they look very much alike. So we thought that this would be a good uh, an important challenge for us at Atlas to really embrace and take, to have a list that would really reflect our values and our objectives and ideas here at Lehman College. So uh, this also generated the impression that, and I'm only focusing on women, but as I said, I could look at multiple, uh, all the layers of oppression and of the so-called minority that we've been talking about. So this generated this impression that women can't write, women write less. And that's why I think it took me so long to find these authors for my class in Women in Latin America. Although they have been writing, despite all those challenges that I talked about. So those are two examples, uh, Safo and Juana Inés de la Cruz, who we have access to, you know, we have access to their work, but who we've been investigating way more intriguingly uh, because of their sexual orientation than because of their work as writers, right? In many cases, that's what has happened. So, um, that's uh, sort of how we felt about that and, and, and some of the things that we thought we should address when putting together this list of books here uh, at Atlas. After a while, I went to a talk by Professor Alicia Galvez, actually, in which she talked about the algorithm and how hard it is for us. Even the algorithm is creating another barrier for us to reach, to get to those authors, because again, they are not the most cited ones, so they are not part of the ones that are going to come in the top of our list. So in this project, we're basically trying to go beyond the list. We also want to gather a list as diverse as possible, as rich as possible, uh, embracing what we believe, because we know that this so-called minorities I've been talking about have been intellectuals, thinkers, authors, philosophers for a very, very long time in many, many places. So our idea is to make them accessible. We're trying to create a platform on top of everything that Karin has already mentioned, maybe manifold, that will make those texts available to all of us or also have them available in our library so that faculty really don't need to take as long to put those readings together. They're going to be there available for us. And students can also reach uh, out to faculty and also directly use these platforms and these links to access those texts. So, with uh, that's that's all I had to say about how we stand, and I I'm really curious to see how this first semester has been going so far in terms of teaching with those texts. And thankfully, we have two amazing professors to share with us their experiences. La Rose Paris, are you gonna go first? <laughs> sure. <It's, yeah. laughs> okay. Sure. Hi. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, my name is Professor LaRose Paris. I'm in the Africana Studies Department. And one of the transformative texts that I regularly, regularly use in my Af um, African American literature class is the work of Frederick Douglass. And um, 
one of the things I talk about with my students in particular is that the tendency for most people when they teach Frederick Douglass and other writers of color as well, Latinx, Asian, Native American writers, the tendency is to think of these writers as only being able to discuss life experiences. And when I say that, I mean in a very limiting way that these writers are reduced to their biographies. And this is something that Lewis Gordon, our famous Lehman alum, the great philosopher discusses in his work. And this tendency, of course, is the result of a Eurocentric bias that grand ideas, um, grand notions about humanity are solely the province of in particular, as Professor Burns just showed you, white men, when she showed you the list of the most cited authors. So that's the tendency. So in our project, we are working against that, not because we don't appreciate the work of white male authors. For example, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is one of my favorite. However, he can also be read alongside someone like Frantz Fanon when we talk about decolonial thinking. So when I teach Frederick Douglass, I stress to my students that Frederick Douglass was not only a former slave who went on to become a, a statesman, because he did. He was general counsel to Haiti. He was an advisor to Lincoln. He advocated for women's rights. Not only did he do all of that, but he was a thinker. He was someone invested in transforming American thought about racism and about egalitarianism. So the first, one of the first things I do is show my students this. This is a four volume work of Douglas's articles, speeches, and writings that was compiled by Philip Foner. It's a famous um, collection and it's called The Life and Writings of Frederick Douglass. And it's split up into four volumes. The, um, we have here the early years, the Civil War decade, during the Civil War and Reconstruction and after. So roughly 40 years of Douglas spending his life devoted to not only the pursuit of knowledge, but the pursuit of equality through discourse, through articulating his ideas about egalitarianism and anti-racism. Um, so I just, um, I'm going to share my screen just for one moment to show something that I show students. And um, just one moment, let me minimize this and minimize this. This is part of a PowerPoint that I show students. And let me put it in slideshow so you can appreciate it. Okay, so in my course, one of the things I discuss is why does black philosophy matter? And that's directly connected to why black history matters. Okay, so prior to teaching about Douglas, we do a section on African American inventors. So this PowerPoint starts off with Lewis Latimer, who perfected Thomas Edison's light bulb. And again, because of the focus on um, Eurocentricity, people don't know that it was an African American inventor that perfected Edison's light bulb. So I say, just as Latter's, Latimer's improvements to Edison's light bulb prove that black history is central to the history of human progress, black philosophy is also central to the furtherance of important concepts like freedom, justice, and equality, okay? And here is Frederick Douglass where my cursor is hovering. Um, Eurocentric curricula falsely teach us that only European and European American philosophers define the meaning of freedom, justice, and equality. For example, Rousseau, um, uh, Locke, and Jefferson. However, these Black philosophers' speeches and writings on freedom, justice, and equality led to the abolition of slavery, the passage of the 19th Amendment, which granted the vote for women, and later the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, okay? So this is Frederick Douglass right here. And when we talk about Douglass, I'm gonna stop my share for a moment. It's so important to understand him as a thinker. Why? Because in the second volume in particular, I, I don't know if I have to, well, I'm gonna show you this second volume, sorry. <laughs> in this second volume in particular, okay? Pre-Civil War decade, Douglass gave two, literally um, groundbreaking speeches. The first was called, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And in that speech, Douglas outlines the hypocrisy of America as a slave-holding nation. 
a nation that itself had gained independence through revolutionary struggle to overthrow British colonialism. So he really, he outlines the, the contours of the Declaration of Independence. And also because it's the 4th of July, asks continually throughout the speech, what is the 4th of July to the slave? It means nothing because while he literally states, while you celebrate, we mourn. And he keeps juxtaposing the celebration of national self-determination in the American state versus the, the, uh, the perpetuation of chattel slavery, which is coexisting. So he constantly goes back and forth between these democratic ideals and their failure to be realized for enslaved Africans in the United States. So that's, that um, particular speech is very, very moving. I know a lot of people teach it. And when I teach it and I share it with my students, they're always, first of all, they're always taken aback by how eloquent Douglas's language is, how formal, how masterful, because he was an autodidact. He was a self-taught man. And, you know, similar to Malcolm X, he didn't have a, the diploma, the degree, but the, his level of erudition and his rhetorical strategies were comparable with philosophers of his generation and his day, and also other great statesmen, etc. So that speech is something when I teach it, I also pair it with a video of his descendants reading it, his great, 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 great grandchildren, National Public Radio did a wonderful, wonderful segment with them reading the uh, what to the slave is the 4th of July, discussing what it means to them and its continued relevance during the Black Lives Matter generation. Because for so many of our authors, I feel it's very important to bring them alive for the students. To, to We look at the text, of course, but then we also bring in some other form of um, learning tool, in this case, a visual learning tool, an audio learning tool of the descendants reading the speech. And it's something that moves the students greatly because they see in the speech, Douglas talks about the fact that pessimism is used as a tool by the oppressor to discourage the downtrodden or the people who are oppressed from resisting. So his descendants were talking about the fact that that's still relevant today, that Black Lives Matter protesters are dissuaded or discouraged, are demonized in many cases by the media. And we are all taught in many cases that the system is not going to change, but no, we have to change it. So his descendants talk about that. So that's extremely a, a wonderful teaching tool. The other speech that Douglas um, gave in 1854 is called the claims of the Negro ethnologically considered. And in that speech, Douglas takes on the American school ethnologists, Samuel Morton, Josiah Knott, George Glidden. And the, the, the thing about the American School Ethnologists that's very important to know is that they promoted the pseudoscience of phrenology, meaning studying skull size. Phrenology is connected to scientific racism, using science to promote racist values. And Douglas takes on these American School Ethnologists, okay? Samuel Morton in particular wrote Crania Americana, okay? which outlined the size of skulls, uh, the difference between European skull size and Native American skull, skull size. He also wrote Crania Egyptica, which promoted a Eurocentric view of, e of Egyptology, which itself is a very Eurocentric field, that claimed that Egypt reached its greatest heights of civiliz civilization because Egyptians were comprised of a European master race. Okay, and this narrative is nothing new. If anyone has seen the movie Gods of Egypt, that's still promoted that Egypt is somehow the only country on the African continent that was populated by Europeans. So in that speech, Douglas, again, uses a brilliant strategy. He uses ancient sources like the Greek historian Herodotus to disprove these claims. Herodotus wrote of, about the Egyptians as a brown people, as an African people. He also uses sources by Comte de Volny, the French explorer sent out by Napoleon to, you know, to, um, what is the word, survey Egypt. And Volny also presented similar findings. So Douglas uses ancient and modern sources and, and states quite poignantly throughout the speech, but Egypt is in Africa. And he says, trying to make a distinction, a racial logical distinction between 
Egyptians and Africans is like saying that Europeans are completely distinct, a separate species and race from European Americans. So he uses, he uses common sense, he uses historical, cultural, and, and linguistic sources to disprove these findings. And he does it in a way to call attention, yet again, to the system of ideas. That system of ideas is scientific racism that provided the justification for the enslavement of Africans. So he takes on that entire school of American school ethnologists, and he shows how their thinking was embraced by the Southern plantation owners. And I talk about that at length in my book, Being Apart, how Douglas shows the connection between the development of racist ideas and policy in the Southern slaveholding states. And he does that quite brilliantly. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Um, the other thing that I do to bring that alive for students is, let me just escape out of here, is to show them this skull size scene from Django Unchained. I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. This is the scene from Django Unchained where Leonardo DiCaprio, and I'm, it's only about 30 seconds I'm gonna play for you. So you get a sense of what the film accomplishes in um, bringing history to life. The science of phrenology is crucial to understanding the separation of our two species. In the skull of the African here, the area associated with submissiveness is larger than any human or any other subhuman species on planet Earth. Okay. So that allows students to understand how it is that this science was, is, was actually part of American history and global history. And they can appreciate what Douglas did in that speech. Because here, Tarantino is showing that it, phrenology became part of the common and popular discourse. So when I show that, I, we also go back to uh, Douglas's speech and they understand the enormity of what he did in that speech, because here we're left with the legacy of that. And it's still, again, a part of popular culture. So getting back to Douglas, it's so important. When we talk about philosophy, and I'm glad Julie Mabie's here. Hi, Julie. Africana philosophy, the, in Africana philosophy, the philosophies of people from the African diaspora, Douglas is a central figure. He's considered a philosopher of existence. He is considered a philosopher who wrote brilliantly about freedom. And we see him in his entirety because it is through Douglas that the contributions, the discussion about the abolition of slavery were actualized. He is a towering figure in Africana philosophy. So when we think about Frederick Douglass, we have to understand him not only as somebody who, he's actually a miraculous figure when you think about what he overcame. He overcame not only the physical limitations of chattel slavery, he overcame the psychological enslavement that was part of that system. How did he do that? By pursuing at all costs his literacy, his scholarship, his, um, by, creating the North Star magazine and having a voice for his thoughts about anti-slavery work. And let me point this out to you. Did um, Douglas's break with the Garrisonian abolitionists, he talks about it in My Bondage and My Freedom. And the main reason he broke with them is because he grew tired at anti-slavery meetings of just talking about his life as a slave. It was no longer enough for him to talk about the daily brutality and injustices. He wanted to talk about the systems, the ideological systems, the social and political systems that enable the slave system to be perpetuated in this country for over 300 years. He wanted to denounce those systems. And in, there's a quote in My Bondage and My Freedom. He says specifically that the Garrisonians told him just take care of the facts. We will deal with the philosophy. And that's what spurred him. That, is, gave, that gave him additional fire 
to continue his, um, his, his own studies, his research, and so that he could denounce these systems that categorized him and his people as, you heard Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio say, subhuman. So he challenged all of that through his, through his scholarship, through his research, through his speeches and activism. So that is why it's so important to move away from thinking about writers of color as just writers who contribute ideas through life experiences because life experiences are also tied to the development of ideas. So of course you, we have to consider them as thinkers. Of course, people like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Malcolm X, others have contributed to the movement of freedom and democracy in this country. Without them, and let me share my screen one last time, my time is running out. Um, without their contribution, what we would, what we ex we see what we've experienced okay what we experienced i'm going to go to the next slide without their contributions okay they envisioned a just multiracial democracy that's what they envisioned douglas did not live to see what has been achieved since his um death nor did ida b wells okay nor did sojourner truth nor did malcolm x but without them, this is the kind of anarchy, and we witnessed it on January 6th. We are, we are either striving towards a multiracial democracy where the contributions, the achievements, the worth and value of every American citizen is uh, something that we understand and appreciate, or we go the other way. And we caught a glimpse of that, and we're still living in the after effects of that, that January 6th um, in, insurrection. So I'll just close by saying that it's so crucial to understand the contributions, the discursive contributions, the contribution of ideas, the contribution of principles and morality that um, thinkers like Douglas and other thinkers of color have contributed to this democracy. And that is his greatest legacy. And that's all I'll say. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Professor Paris. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to present in, on this esteemed panel um, and to be a part of the Atlas program uh, with my colleagues under the leadership of Professor Beck, uh, Professor Burns, and Professor Paris. Um, I'm going to talk today about my experience teaching one of the pilot courses um, this semester. Uh, the course I'm teaching is one of the bread, bread and butter courses that I um, frequently teach on an annual basis. Um, societies and cultures of Latin America. Um, I'm going to share in the chat um, the link to the syllabus just in case anyone is um, interested in following along with that. Um, so uh, this course this semester, I have 29 students. Um, about half of them are, are first years. And most are taking the course as a requirement. They didn't necessarily choose to be there because of the content. Um, they chose because it fit their schedule and fit their requirements. Um, and most are not majors in Latin America, um, Latin American studies or anthropology. Um, the course format is um, high flex. Students have the option to attend in Zoom or in the classroom. Um, most of the students are choosing Zoom. I always have a couple of, you know, two, three, four that um, attend in person. Um, this is how I, I, I don't expect you to, to read this. I'll just, um, I just wanted to show you, this is kind of how I frame transformative texts in my syllabus. Um, and I wanna point out just um, a couple of key aspects. And I also wanna just tell you a little bit about my pedagogical orientation. Um, I'm deeply committed to non-hierarchical, consent-based and anti-racist pedagogy. And my goal is for my students to be empowered over their own learning. Rather than seeing my role as delivery of content, I consider it my role to foster engagement, debate, and critical thinking. And typically in this course, I teach, I choose contemporary ethnographic texts to, to teach. Also, typically, I tend to give students a lot of reading. <laughs> it's always in my evaluations that I give them too much reading. Um, and I consider it one of my learning goals usually to help them navigate, um, you know, kind of a large quantity of materials. Um, but in this semester with this um, approach, 
I thought I would, you know, take a totally different approach because that approach not only wasn't working for me, I often had this situation where too few students had done enough of the reading to foster a robust discussion. And so we ended up having to kind of cover a lot of the materials in class in order to then have a, a kind of shortened discussion about them. Um, so for this semester, inspired both by this Atlas pilot, as well as um, my engagement in the WAC program, and in particular, a few conversations I had with my colleague, Jessica Wood Uden, um, the English department, I decided to go completely in the opposite direction and opt for depth um, of engagement over quantity. Um, and ask myself, what if my students only read a few core texts, but they read them closely and they engaged with them deeply? which texts would they be and how would we navigate them? So I decided to choose these six texts that are listed here. Um, three of them are historical, three of them are contemporary. And I thought that they would enable us to cover all of the topics that we usually cover in societies and culture of Latin America, while centering the voices, perspectives and experiences of indigenous and Afro Latin American people, especially women. Um, so, one of the tools that I've found incredibly useful in this is Perusal. Um, Perusal is a web-based social reading platform. It enables faculty to assign texts, videos, and any other kinds of materials that students can access, read, and annotate um, collaboratively while they're working from home. We don't have an institutional uh, subscription, so I'm using uh, the free version. With an institutional subscription, I think that it would, um, you know, kind of integrate with our learning management system. Uh, so with Perusal, you can see how the course page looks for students um, with reading assignments um, here in the middle for each class section. Most of the assignments are only about 10 to 15 pages. And as you can see with the sample from the pie graph, um, the vast majority of my students are engaging deeply with the readings, spending an average of two hours, two and a half hours um, reading each, each assignment. Um, I ask them to, and, and then fully a third are achieving the maximum level of engagement. Um, I ask them to read and annotate in advance of the class. And then in class, we discuss, um, talk about questions that, that have arisen in their, in their work and unpack what they've read further. And this is where I can highlight some of the key concepts um, and ideas that have emerged in the text. Um, this engagement with the text constitutes the bulk of their grade in the class. So rather than um, having to kind of layer on an additional arbitrary, stressful, high stakes um, assessment, uh, the learning is ongoing throughout the semester and, or, and assessment is organic and ongoing as well. Um, so you can see here, um, you know, just one sample. This is a page from uh, Broken Spears, um, which is an edited collection of primary texts, most written by eyewitnesses to the conquest of Tenochtitlan by Cortes in the early 16th century. Um, these texts were written in Nahuatl and then translated back to Spanish and then to, into English, translated to Spanish and then into English. Um, students very quickly become accustomed to navigating these difficult tests, texts and talking about problems of translation and transmission between written, pictographic and oral history traditions. We talk about why are there so few texts written from the perspective of those who were on the receiving end of Euro European violence, genocide and conquest. And we talk about the differences between different kinds of historiography, both text-based and non-text-based. The students in interact quite um, dynamically before they even come to class. Um, so you can see here along the side, there are three students having a conversation about the nature of, of text versus oral history as a form of transmission of memory. Um, so the students, um, when they come to class, are able to pick up pretty seamlessly from where they've left off um, at home. And I'm able to see very easily with this collective annotation um, what sorts of concepts might have been missed um, or you know, if they're confused about an important concept. And we're able to dive in at a pretty deep level the moment we start class. 
Um, this is another example. Um, in our second text, um, we have excerpts from the 1400 page uh, Nueva Coronica y Buen Gobierno by Juan Poma de Ayala. It's a letter to the Spanish crown um, written in the early 17th century in which the author is asking for his Inca noble brethren to be given administrative power over the colony of Peru from the rape rapacious and abusive Spaniards. Um, the text is written in a combination of Quechua, Aymara, um, Spanish, as well as um, illustrations, um, which constitute about a third of the text. Um, and the students, I thought, would you know, be a little bit overwhelmed by everything going on in this text, including you know, the kind of all caps <laughs> captions that a lot of the illustrations have that are a combination of two or three languages, including archaic Spanish. Um, but they seem to actually really be engaged and enjoying the text very much. And I'm really delighted with the level of um, not only comprehension, but just evident enjoyment that they seem to be having as they decipher and decode this together. Um, so next, I would like to invite Enrique Aguas, who is here, um, who's one of the students in the class, um, to give us his perspective. Um, Enrique, I'm going to turn it over to you for a moment. Hello, how's, how's everybody? <laughs> Hi, so um, my name is Enrique Aguas, and I am a junior student, but a first year, so I transferred from Washington Community, and this is my first experience with uh, this style of class. I've always found myself in classes where, uh, well, before I was a STEM major, so I was doing a lot of, like, math and science and stuff, but at least in any literature class, I always found myself, uh, like the professor mentioned, doing a lot of reading and a lot of writing, um, and now I'm doing still a lot of reading, but I feel like I'm able to discuss the, the text much, much better, um, at least during class and uh, through the use of perusal. I'm able to just engage with my students and I'm able to pick up on, on everything much better because I feel through conversation, I'm able to learn and pick up all the concepts much easier. Um, in class, I'm always trying my best to like participate actually and one of the few that tries to attend most of the time. So uh, at least being able to talk to uh, Professor Gavis, I, I feel like I, I can pick up and, and relate to it more. Um, another thing is, that I really like is that a lot of these texts that we're reading are from uh, a perspective of the people that were actually, that actually dealt with, with this, not from uh, the European perspective, so to say. Um, so you actually get a lot of indigenous uh, perspectives of the text, just something that I feel like is really rare, especially um, I grew up, I was born in Colombia and I grew up there for, I mean, I, I lived there till I was about 10 years old. And then I moved here and I always felt like all the textbooks and things that, were, that we were reading were all just not, it just did, it didn't seem like it was coming from somebody that actually experienced this or, or, or really, or, or it didn't really show, um, um, I guess just the event at, at like, like it's the whole event essentially, just for lack of a better word or phrasing. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, what I've been able to uh, pick up from the class. Um, and I appreciate that uh, you guys are able to experiment and, and you know, try these new ways of uh, teaching. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enrique. Um, if uh, it's possible for you to stay for a few minutes, I know you're super busy, but people might have a couple of questions for you at the end. We'll be wrapping up in a few minutes and maybe questions will rise for, about your student experience. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I, just to wrap up, I just wanted to share um, just a couple of um, reflections from the from other students in the class. Um, this is a screen uh, using Jamboard on Google um, where I asked students to respond to, you know, how is this different for them uh, to read primary texts in the way that we're doing. Um, Oftentimes when we do Jamboard, sometimes I get one or two word answers. And with this one, I was sort of struggling to, even though they were working in small groups. Um, and so a lot of these are collective responses from two or three students. Um, they still had so much to say, it was a little bit hard to fit it all in. Um, 
but I think you can see um, that they're, you know, having a, a pretty substantive experience with the texts, um, even so far, you know, and we're barely halfway into the course. Um, and, you know, they're having, I think some of them were surprised that the close reading is the ask. It is the <laughs> kind of the way that we're doing um, the work of the class. They keep kind of expecting me to spring a surprise quiz on them, I think. Um, but now at this point, we've sort of settled into the into the groove where they realize that, you know, the close reading is is the work and it's where the learning is happening. And so I'm quite pleased with um, how much um, substantive learning is going on in the course. Um, and I'll stop there. Um, and I think we, you know, can take questions. Um, that might correspond to the whole panel. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I know we have time for a few questions from the in-house audience and from online. Do we have any online questions, Elena? Really? No questions? Amy. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. So that was African studies. La what are the examples of the classes that this is being rolled out with? So the, the LEH classes only for um, their writing intensive classes? No, they are not all writing intensive classes. Professor Galvez's class, for example, as she just pointed out, is not writing intensive. But okay. most of them are LEH um, writing intensive classes. Four of them are cross-listed classes that are just like Professor Galvez's and Professor Paris's class, which are classes that are general education classes and classes in the major that are cross-listed with LEH 300 classes, uh, 350 classes, and four of them, I think, are freestanding LEH 350 classes, um, mainly in philosophy. But we are still very open, everybody who is on here on the Zoom, we're still very open to suggestions for classes for the spring. We now have five full-time faculty members that have agreed to teach a transformative text class in the spring, but we are still taking more. Uh, Karen, let me just add, uh, one of the common themes, I want to, by the way, I want to commend a wonderful colleagues uh, for the, the, the work they have done, enormous work to get us where we are. But I think one of the things you begin to see uh, from the presentation thus far uh, is all of them standing on three important pillars that really uh, begin to talk about how the characteristics of a Lehman graduate, educated, empowered, and engaged. Those are the common themes you saw from the CUNY train. You also see it in this particular conversation in terms of uh, what, and I think it's also part of what um, uh, Dr. Gardner raised uh, today and in, 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 in our discussions yesterday prior to today's uh, um, summit. What does a Lehman graduate look like? What do we want that Lehman graduate to acquire and to be known for when they leave our, our institution? And that's why you see the redesigned, the rethinking that has occurred here uh, that really is reflective of uh, what we want to see our students as critical thinkers and learners. So I want to commend, commend uh, the three of them and Karen and others who have worked on this uh, particularly. So thank you so much for this important work. We also have some questions in the chat, uh, so I'm just going to read them out one by one. Um, so I'll start with, um, um, 
let me see, here we go. Uh, Dr. Beck said there were 150 plus texts gathered. Is there any way to share the list? Yes, Vice President Sarmiento, we are working on this. I'm, we're just still really working on cleaning it up and making it, um, making it presentable. And like so many academics, we are very reluctant to share a work in progress too early. But I think later this month or early next month, we will be able to share the list as we have it and also combine that with inviting everybody to contribute to the list. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to give you some feedback. Um, I'm sure all of us who would listen to something like this w would think about how does this relate to me and the work I do in my own life history and my own experience. I want, I want you to know that as an aging white male, I feel cheated. I've realized that uh, when I went to college, undergraduate school, I had to take 40 courses, three credits each, and I did a count mentally while I listened to you and only four of them were taught by women. Four out of 40. And I think I'm probably pretty representative of the lot of men who run America's colleges and universities who had undergraduate experiences like that. And secondly, I was thinking that you, uh, for women, you gave a whole new meaning to the term panel. This wasn't a panel. This was a seminar with four substantive, at least, presentations they were cognitively thoughtful and stimulating and whet my appetite for more. I'm wondering, you know, how you could um, uh, take this further. I'll make some suggestions about that in the concluding session this afternoon. Um, I'd love to see you put together um, a reader, maybe an online version that could be used by other colleges and universities. I think there could be a tremendous market for that. Um, I'm wondering if you couldn't take some of these texts and use them in multiple courses. So like the, you used to have a learning community structure here at the college. I don't know whether you still do, but where you could use these readings across disciplines, but you faculty who would provide the readings, you could do professional development for the faculty who were teaching those. So it makes me also wonder how the college convenes faculty and staff to hear other faculty like you share your ideas and share your work. And I'll want to come back to that later, but uh, this session has been worth the whole trip. I'm not even sure I should answer to that. Just very quickly, we still have the um, learning community structure in the first year experience. We have, for many reasons, decided to start the ATLAS project with the LEH 300 classes and the trans transfer students. But that's the start. We're planning on growing it out from there. So right now there's no learning communities around that, but it's a great idea to develop that as a next step. Thank you very much. And I also will add to Karen's uh, comment uh, that we're working with um, Teagle Foundation. We've, we've been really in uh, close engagement with them uh, these past many months. Uh, with the planning grant they provided us. And uh, they have also extended invitation for us uh, for a much larger grant. So that too we're working on uh, that would allow us to extend and expand um, uh, these opportunities to more faculty. I do want to just also add to Karen's initial point in terms of the providing the context. Uh, there were several workshops that were held and almost 100 faculty members from across the college uh, participated in those initial workshops. So this has really been um, a work in progress under the leadership of the faculty that you've seen here, uh, um, uh, Dr. LaRose and uh, Dr. Burns. And, and of course, um, Dr. Dr. Galvez is one of those faculty members uh, engaged in the pilot of the nine uh, classes that have been taught this semester. So this has really been a bottom-up approach <laughs> led by faculty. Uh, and what I've loved about this is the way they have really reasoned this and rethought it, acknowledging what's there, but also engaging our students in understanding uh, the many, many frontiers of knowledge that exist there to shape uh, uh, the human uh, uh, problem and context. So thank you again.
I think we only have um, uh, time for one more question. There are lots of powerful comments in the chat and discussion, so thank you for that. Um, so the question um, that I'd like to read out is, how would you express the growth that you see in students from the beginning of the semester to the end? Well, we are not at the end yet. We can only talk so far about the growth people have seen from the beginning of the semester until now. And I have to, you know, I'm not teaching a transformative text class. So Alicia or La Rose, does one of you want to answer this question? Sure. Um, I mean, from my perspective, uh, I'm seeing just a much higher level of engagement than I ordinarily see with the texts. Um, in the past, I've seen students um, who come to class very enthusiastic, but without necessarily having had the preparation prior to class. And there's something about the combination, I don't know if it's the gamification features of perusal or the social aspect, um, or the fact that it makes the, the annotation process, which could be very tedious and boring, actually kind of accessible and fun. Um, but for whatever reason, students are coming, you know, just much better prepared. And so I see that as, as a very good sign of growth. And then we're able to have just a much more substantive conversation. So in spite of the technical difficulties of high flex and having a lot of students still on Zoom, um, which can be very alienating and disconnected. Um, it is fostering a much more meaningful discussion than I've been able to achieve in a lot of courses. La Rose, would you like to add? Sure. Um, I agree with Alicia. I think the students overall are much more engaged and they're more interested in reading. That's what I have found when they discover the work of Douglas and others, they feel just as um, Provost Wosu said, they feel engaged and empowered and they're educated because they feel, um, as I think as one of the previous speakers had mentioned, feeling cheated out of getting this kind of exposure and knowledge. So it really, it opens them up in a way that for us as educators is always so gratifying because we know that they're going to leave the classroom wanting more, seeking more, creating more just based on the ideas they're learning. So I would say students are, they grow intellectually significantly um, already just at this point. So at the end we'll see, but already they're, they just have so much um, wonder when we talk about someone like Douglas and other writers, like why haven't I learned this before? And it makes them want more, want to learn more, so yeah. Thank you, Dr. Beck. But before I close out this session, um, Alina, you said that there were some very interesting comments online. Do you, would you like to share one or two of those comments? Because I think this is a very rich discussion. I think it's, not, it's something that I do not want to just pass over very lightly. So do you want to share one or two of those comments? Sure, please? I'm going to just get to those comments to read them out loud. Um, so there are conversations about uh, the technical questions about perusal, um, and I know Alicia Galvez um, mentioned this tool. So there was uh, there were some comments asking, you know, how does it work? Um, are there institutional plans for us to use that um, uh, at the college level? Um, also. Um, there are comments about the fact that this has been a, a terrific discussion, very insightful, and um, being proud of, uh, to be a member of the Lehman community. Um, then there are posts about um, really enjoying um, uh, the reading list, uh, and it's really boosting um, the reading list and enjoying the rich discussions that other strong women panelists have contributed to. Uh, one of the other comments is, um, Wonderful and informative presentation. It's really exciting to see um, broadening of the literature. This has the potential to really connect people through the larger human experience. Also a note that the Frederick Douglass, a lot of his speeches were covered widely in the 19th century newspapers available for free and at home using the NYPL um, New York Public Library 19th century newspaper database. Um, so lots of comments and sharing, um, thank you. Thank you, Elena. And um, it would be a miss of me if I close this session without saying thank you to, to Susan Ebersole, our VP for Institutional Advancement, that she's been working with us from the very onset. Um, and she's been a critical um, partner as we have this discussion with the Tigre Foundation. So 
Thank you, Karen, and thank you to your panelists for this rich um, discussion on Atlas and transformative techs here at Lehman College.